What a great pleasure to be here today with an overwhelmingly female audience to share with you both the personal story that led to my becoming an historian, as well as the stories of several of the first ladies that I have lived with over the course of time as I've written my presidential histories. Now, it may seem an odd profession to spend one's days and nights with dead presidents, but I wouldn't change it for anything in the world. For each time I am catapulted back into a different era, learning from the struggles and triumphs of people who have lived before. My only fear is that in the afterlife, there's going to be a panel of all the presidents that I've ever studied, and every single one is going to be telling me every single thing I got wrong about them. And the first person to yell out will be Lyndon Johnson. How come that damn book on the Kennedys was twice as long as the book you wrote about me? But as long as I can remember, I have loved history. A love shaped, I believe, by two childhood experiences. First, my mother's chronic illness. She had had rheumatic fever as a child, which left her with a damaged heart, so damaged that the doctor said she had the arteries of an 80-year-old when she was only 30 years old. Though it made her an invalid, it meant she read books in every spare moment she could find, though having only an eighth grade education. And every night she would read to me as long as I could stay awake, that childhood dream of never having to go to sleep. The only thing I loved more than listening to a book was listening to stories about her girlhood. I somehow became obsessed with the idea that if I could keep her talking about the days when she was young and healthy before her illness set in, that her mind would control her body and this premature aging process would be stopped in its tracks. So I would constantly say to her, Mom, tell me a story about you and the days when you were young, not realizing how peculiar this was until I had my own three boys who never once have said to me, Mom, tell me a story about you when you were young. But though my mother died just before I turned 15, the books and the stories she shared with me have kept her memory alive ever since. But the second root of my love of history can be traced to my father's love of baseball. When I was only six years old, he taught me that mysterious art of keeping score while listening to baseball games, so that when he went to work in New York that day, I could record for him the history of that afternoon's Brooklyn Dodger game. And then when he came home, I realized that I, I now, in excruciating detail, would recount every single play of every inning of the game that had just taken place that afternoon. But he made me feel I was telling him a fabulous story from history. It made me think there was something magic about history to keep my father's attention. In fact, I'm convinced I learned the narrative art from those nightly sessions with my father because at first I'd be so excited, I would blurt out, the Dodgers won or the Dodgers lost, which took much of the drama of this two-hour telling away. So I finally learned you had to tell a story from beginning to middle to end. He made it even more special for me when I was only six years old. He never told me that all of this was actually described in great detail in the sports pages of the newspapers the next day. So I thought without me, he wouldn't even know what happened to the Brooklyn Dodgers. But if my love of history was rooted in those two childhood experiences, my fascination with the presidency began when I was a 24-year-old White House fellow during LBJ's administration. It was a great program. Colin Powell was a White House fellow, Wesley Clark. We had a big dance at the White House the night we were selected. President Johnson did dance with me, not that peculiar. There were only three women out of the 16 White House fellows. But as he twirled me around the floor, he whispered that he wanted me to be assigned directly to him in the White House. But it was not to be that simple, for in the months leading up to my selection, like many young people, while I was a graduate student at Harvard, I was involved in the anti-Vietnam War movement and had written an article against LBJ, which unfortunately came out in the New Republic two days after the dance in the White House. And the title of the article was How to Remove Lyndon Johnson from Power. <laughs> so I was certain he would kick me out of the program. But instead, surprisingly, he said, oh, bring her down here for a year. And if I can't win her over, no one can. So I did end up working for him in the White House and then accompanying him to his ranch to help him on his memoirs the last years of his life. And I must say, the older I've gotten, the more I realize what an incredible privilege it was to have spent so many hours with this aging lion of a man, a victor in a thousand contests, three great civil rights laws, Medicare, aid to education, and yet so roundly defeated in the end, so sad and so vulnerable because of the war in Vietnam, that he opened up to me in ways he never would have had I known him at the height of his power. And I'd like to believe that privilege fired within me the drive to understand the inner person behind the public figure, to look empathetically at my subject as I moved from LBJ to JFK to FDR to Abraham Lincoln, and finally to Theodore Roosevelt and William Howard Taft, my just published book on the bully pulpit, 
which explores the close friendship between the two presidents, with, which ruptured with great heartbreak to both men when they ran against each other in 1912. It took me seven years to write, though I rationalized that my involvement with the Lincoln movie may be shaved off one or two years of that time. But in the course of exploring Theodore Roosevelt's and William Howard Taft and the tumultuous decades at the turn of the 20th century known as the Gilded Age and the Progressive Era, I delved into the lives of their wives, Edith Corot Roosevelt and Nellie Heron Taft, with Edith embodying a vision of womanhood peering into the past while Nellie gazed into the future. So I'd like to tell you a few stories about them. Edith Corot and Theodore Roosevelt had been intimate childhood friends growing up together in New York's Union Square neighborhood. She had joined Teddy and his younger sister Corinne in a private schoolroom arranged at the Roosevelt Mansion. Even as children, they missed each other when they were apart. As Teddy was leaving with his family for a year-long grand tour of Europe when he was 11 years old, he broke down in tears at the thought of leaving eight-year-old Edith behind. Edith had been a regular guest at the Roosevelt summer home on Long Island where they sailed together in the bay rode horseback along the trails, and shared a growing passion for literature. As adolescents, they were dancing partners at cotillions and constant companions on the social scene. In the summer after Roosevelt's sophomore year at Harvard, however, the young couple had a mysterious falling out. One day, Roosevelt later wrote, there came a break during a late afternoon rendezvous at the summer house at the estate. The conflict that erupted, he admitted, ended their very intimate relations. The intense relationship that Edith had cherished for nearly two decades then seemed lost forever the following October when Roosevelt met Alice Hathaway Lee, the beautiful, enchanting daughter of a wealthy Boston businessman. The young Harvard junior fell in love with his whole heart and soul, he said. Four months after his graduation in 1880, they were married. Then in 1884, only two days after giving birth to their only child, Alice Lee died. So intense was his love for his beautiful young wife that he was certain he would never love again. The light has gone out of my life, he said. In the desolate months after her death, he retreated to the Dakota Badlands, where he purchased a ranch and immersed himself in the daily work of the ranch hands. Constant activity prevented overthought, he said, and he was finally able to sleep at night. At the same time, the beauty of the landscape seemed to seep into his very soul, producing a lifelong love of open spaces that would eventually lead to the great conservation measures and the national parks permanently associated with his name. In the Badlands, his depression gradually subsided, and in time, he came back to New York, re-met Edith Corot, fell deeply in love with her, sustaining a lifelong joyous marriage with his childhood friend. Now for Edith, the resurrection of her relationship with Theodore, the man she said she loved with the passion of a girl who had never loved before, offered the prospect of happiness that had eluded her since childhood after her once wealthy father lost his business and became an alcoholic, forcing Edith to draw a protective curtain around herself and her life at home as it was crumbling, generating an intense desire for the security and domestic coherence of a family of her own. When she married Roosevelt and had six children, she told a friend the chief end of her life lay not in her public duties as a politician's wife, but in providing her incessantly moving husband with a home, a sanctuary, a still point, a kind of spiritual bath that sent him back into public life refreshed and ready for what might come. As First Lady, she remained an intensely private and traditional wife and mother, presenting none of what was then called the new woman attributes, she believed a woman's name should appear in print but twice, when she is married and when she is buried. She refrained publicly from expressing political opinions and routinely declined interview requests. Surrounded by the warmth of her beloved family, she stepped into history as one of the least known first ladies. Well, young Nellie Heron Taft, by contrast, was an unconventional woman from the start. From early adolescence, she craved a more expansive life. She was an avid reader, a talented writer with a passion for classical music. While her brothers departed for Harvard and Yale, however, she was informed that her father would not send her to college. Yearning to be busy and accomplish something, she took a job teaching in a boys' school. Do you realize you will have to give up society and possibly marriage, her mother warned, but Nellie believed that marriage would destroy her hard-won chance to accomplish something worthy in her own right. In her diary, she recorded raucous evenings in the beer halls in the German section of Cincinnati, 
where she talked politics mixed with laborers and merchants. She said it might seem unsuitable behavior for a society girl, but she loved the atmosphere. <clears throat> Finally, in young Will Taft, Nellie found a potential husband who adored her and highly valued her intelligence. Their union provided a channel for her to pursue her love of politics and her intense ambition to accomplish something vital in her life. At every stage in Taft's career, she spurred him forward. They labored together over speeches. They discussed political strategy in a manner one observer recalled, much like two men who are intimate chums. Taft later said if it hadn't been for Nellie, he would have happily remained a judge in Cincinnati. Instead, he accepted a job as Solicitor General, which led to the Governor Generalship of the Philippines, where Nellie left a permanent mark on the country by conducting a campaign to reduce infant mortality by providing children with sterilized milk. And then the Governor Generalship led to an appointment to Roosevelt's cabinet, where Taft became his closest advisor. Indeed, the acting president he became when Roosevelt was away for months at a time, traveling by whistle-stop tours around the country or simply going on his hunting trips. It's inconceivable to imagine such long absences today. When Roosevelt was asked, how are things going to be managed in your absence, he said, oh, things will be all right. I've left Taft sitting on the lid, inspiring, of course, cartoons of Taft's rather large 350-pound figure sitting on the lid of a huge number of domestic problems. <clears throat> now, in the middle of his second term as president, Roosevelt offered Taft a seat on the Supreme Court, satisfying the dream his friend had long held to be on the court. But Nellie thought then that he was a presidential candidate, which he was, and held him back. So during Taft's presidential campaign to succeed Roosevelt, journalists considered Nellie his key advisor, almost on a par with Roosevelt himself, who provided an endless stream of advice to Taft. Don't answer your opponent, attack him. Let the audience see you smile always, because I feel your nature shines out so transparently when you smile, you big, generous, high-minded fellow. On and on he went, but I doubt that Roosevelt influenced the selection of Taft's campaign song, which was, get on a raft with Taft. If you got on a raft with 350-pound Taft, <clears throat> I'm not sure how long you'd be on that raft. Well, Taft's inauguration, Nellie said, was the happiest day of her life. At First Lady, she cheerfully announced that she considered herself a public personage. She immediately took the cause of working women up. She helped design and, and fund a popular free park with free concerts for the people of Washington. She brought the cherry trees to Washington and opened previously exclusive White House guest list to all manner of people. In early May, the New York Times wrote a long article praising the 49-year-old Nellie as the most activist First Lady in a generation. But the very next day after that article, while sailing on a presidential yacht with a group of guests, Nellie suddenly grew faint and collapsed. It turned out she had suffered a devastating stroke, which paralyzed her right side. While she eventually recovered the ability to walk, she was never able to speak again in connected sentences. For days, observed Taft's military aide, Archie Butt, he looked like a great stricken animal. Never had the aide seen greater suffering or pain on a man's face. Hour after hour, Taft spent with Nellie, coaxing her to master certain words so she could deliver stock phrases such as happy to see you or glad you are here, but any more complex expressions never returned. The fierce and loving voice that had counseled and prodded Taft to every achievement, consoled him through every insecurity, was silent. Her illness shadowed every day of Taft's unhappy presidency. Well, if Edith Roosevelt chose domestic happiness as the wife and mother of her family, and Nellie chose to become her husband's closest political partner, Eleanor Roosevelt, who I lived with for six years while completing Franklin and Eleanor, emerged as a powerful figure in her own right. Indeed, Eleanor's story directly connects with that of Theodore Roosevelt, for Theodore's younger brother, Elliot, was Eleanor's father. Eleanor's journey to become an historic figure in her own right begins with the recognition that while she grew up in a privileged background, she had little in the way of constant love. Her mother was so beautiful, portrait painters vied to paint her, making Eleanor feel that her mother was forever disappointed in her daughter's lack of a pretty face. Her mother actually called her granny when she was a little girl because she looked so old and plain, even as a small child. Her father, Elliot, had suffered epilepsy as a child and eventually became an alcoholic. When Eleanor was just nine, her mother died, 
following year, her father tried to jump out of a window and died soon afterwards. She was sent to live with strict but unloving grandparents. Her salvation came when she went to an all-girls boarding school in England. The headmistress became her mother figure, persuading her to make more of her life than the entrance into the debutante world, which she had feared for as long as she could remember. She returned home, became involved in settlement housework, which she adored. When she married her distant cousin, Franklin Roosevelt, the start of, at the start of Teddy Roosevelt's second term, President Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt, gave her away. She was his niece. And so popular was Teddy at the time that all attention was focused on him. Indeed, it was teasingly said of Teddy Roosevelt that he so loved being in the center of action that he wanted to be not only the bride at the wedding, but the baby at the baptism and the corpse at the funeral. <clears throat> well, after her marriage and children, Eleanor felt compelled to give up her beloved work in the settlement house. Her mother-in-law, who exerted a dominant influence on the family, persuaded her she might bring diseases home to her children, that it was unseemly for a woman of her class to work, leaving a big void in Eleanor's life, creating within her a measure of anxiety and tension. Ironically, a catastrophe in her private life proved a liberating force. After 12 years of marriage and six children, Eleanor discovered a packet of love letters to her, from her husband to a beautiful young woman named Lucy Mercer, who was relaxed, gay, and confident in ways Eleanor was then not. She later said the bottom dropped out of her world. She offered him a divorce, but it was the last thing he wanted, and when he pledged never to see Lucy again, she agreed to stay together in marriage. But it transformed their relationship. A new path opened for her. She would no longer be defined solely by her husband's wants and needs. She was determined to shape a role for herself beyond her family. No more guilt about working outside. She joined a circle of progressive feminists dedicated to abolishing child labor, passing protective legislation for female workers, fighting for minimum wage and maximum hours. She learned she had a whole range of talent she never knew she had before for organizing people, inspiring them to loyalty, delivering speeches. And three years later, when Franklin got polio and was paralyzed from the waist down, she became, as he said, his eyes and ears. Traveling her all across the state and eventually the country when he became president, bringing him back human stories of social conditions that put a face onto dry statistics, making passage of legislation for migrant workers, sweatshop workers, coal miners, all possible. She provided in many ways a voice for the voiceless. Meanwhile, she revolutionized the role of first lady, becoming the first to speak at a national convention, the first to testify before Congress, the first to write a daily column, the first to hold weekly press conferences, where she made a simple rule, only female reporters could attend her press conferences, so stuffy publishers all over the country had to hire their first female reporter. Indeed, an entire generation of female journalists got their start because of Eleanor Roosevelt's press conferences. Then when World War II came, she argued that the fight for democracy abroad had to be accompanied by a fight to strengthen it at home. It meant she had to become an agitator, often pushing her agenda on her husband, who was focused solely on the war. It meant she had to be willing to argue with him. He might have been happier, she later said, with a wife who was completely uncritical. That I was never able to be, and he had to find it in other people. Nevertheless, I think I sometimes acted as a spur, even though the spurring was not always wanted to be welcomed. It also meant she had to be willing to bear criticism. It was a constant refrain. Can't you muzzle that wife of yours, someone wrote? Do you have lace on your panties for allowing her to speak out so much? A visitor, a fancy visitor to the White House, got dust on her gloves and wrote in a paper, can't Eleanor stay home and keep the White House clean? What is the matter with her? Her main focus, however, was to champion the rights of blacks and women. It was Eleanor who was largely responsible for pressuring her husband to sign the FEPC, the Fair Employment Practice Commission, with sanctions and incentives to get companies to open their doors to African Americans. More than two million got jobs at all skill levels they had never enjoyed before. And it was Eleanor who pressured the military to soften discrimination, sending so many memos to General Marshall that he had to assign a separate general whose only task was to deal with Eleanor Roosevelt. And <clears throat> It was Eleanor who was way ahead of her time in opening doors for women. In the early days, she fought tirelessly against prejudiced factory owners in airplane factories and shipyards who argued women will never learn how to operate these complicated machines. They'll disrupt harmony in the plants. They'll distract men on the assembly lines. 
restructuring will be necessary, we don't have enough toilets, productivity will go down. But as the need for female workers grew exponentially with men in the armed forces, they had to open their doors to women. Eleanor's first task then was to persuade women to take up the challenge. She worked with the media. Rosie the Riveter ads appeared with blue-eyed, rosy-cheeked women with kerchiefs on their heads, a rivet gun in their laps, powder puffs in their pocket, the perfect combination of femininity and strength. And she made a personal appeal to the women. If I were a young woman, she said, I would go to work in a factory at once. And women responded magnificently. By 1943, women constituted 60% of the workforce in the airplane factories and the shipyards. And the great thing was that productivity went up rather than down. Supervisors reported that women were more patient with detail, more eager to learn, more willing to help one another. And then they did a study. How was it possible for these women to learn these complex machines so well and so quickly? I love the answer that came back on one of the study forms. They said it was simple. When a woman, unlike a man, was asked to operate a new piece of machinery, she would ask directions. <laughs> I am sure it was more complicated than that, but any of us who drove with our men in the days before GPS understand exactly what that means. And then at the height of a war, there was a crusty factory owner who spoke to a female reporter. I'll deny it to the end of my days if you use my name. In fact, I'll deny that I ever saw you. But if I had my way now, I'd say, to hell with the men. Give me the women. Well, one of my favorite stories about women during World War II concerned the cutback in any item containing rubber during the rubber shortage, such that no more rubber toys, bottles, or tires for private cars were able to be manufactured. Everything was taken in stride until an announcement was made that rubber girdles would no longer be manufactured or sold. What will happen to our posture, women cried. If our stomachs stick out, our men's morale will go down. So Franklin Roosevelt made an exception and women's rubber girdles continued to be manufactured during the entire war. Well, at the start, women faced insurmountable problems in balancing home and family lives. Eleanor recognized that daycare was a central issue. She initiated a national campaign arguing that daycare centers were as essential as cafeterias. The resistance was great at first at the radical thought of children being cared for outside the home. The first ray of hope came when she persuaded progressive businessman Henry Kaiser to set up a model daycare center at his shipyards in Portland, Oregon, where 4,000 of the 16,000 women were mothers with children of preschool age. A spectacular center was set up, staffed by nutritionists, teachers, doctors, open six days a week, 24 hours a day, 52 weeks a year, providing not only an early education for the kids, but providing hot meals for the mothers to take home at the end of the day so they wouldn't have to cook and shop when their day's work was done. It served as a prototype for a series of daycare centers all over the country where public funds helped to construct the centers which businesses then operated. And through it all, so far ahead of her time, Eleanor inspired women to demand equal pay for equal work. Now to be sure, Eleanor's far-flung activities meant that she was away from FDR much of the time. She was actually on the road more than 200 days every year. But Roosevelt was not alone during World War II because the White House actually became the most exclusive residential hotel you could possibly imagine. It began because he wanted to have a cocktail hour every night and relax and talk about anything other than the war. And then he wanted his friends ready and waiting to be at the cocktail hour. So he invited them to sleep overnight continually during the White House. His foreign policy advisor came for dinner one night. Harry Hopkins, early in the war, slept over, never left till the war came to an end. His secretary, Missy Lahand, who'd loved him from the time she was 18, lived with the family in the White House. A princess from Norway, Princess Martha, in exile in America during the war, lived with the family on that second floor in the weekend. And the great Winston Churchill came and spent weeks at a time in a room diagonally across from Roosevelt's. So when I was writing Franklin and Eleanor, I became obsessed with the thought of all these people in their bathrobes at night on the second floor of the corridor and what incredible conversations they must have had and wish that I'd been up there when I was up there with LBJ when I was 24, I'd ask, where did Churchill sleep? Where was Eleanor? Where was Franklin? But of course, I wasn't thinking in those terms then. So I mentioned this on a radio program, and it happened that Hillary Clinton then in the White House was listening. So she promptly called me up at the radio station and invited me to sleep overnight in the White House. She said we could then wander the corridor together and figure out where everyone had slept. So two weeks later, she followed up with an invitation to a state dinner, after which between midnight and 2 a.m., the president, Mrs. Clinton, my husband and I, with my map in hand, went through every room up there and figured out, yes, Chelsea Clinton is sleeping where Harry Hopkins was. 
Bill Clinton is sleeping where FDR was, and we were in Winston Churchill's bedroom, which meant there was no way I could sleep. I was certain he was sitting in the corner drinking his brandy and smoking his ever-present cigar. In fact, that bedroom is the scene of my favorite story in World War II when Churchill came there. He and Roosevelt, right after Pearl Harbor, was set to sign a document that put the Associated Nations against the Axis powers, but no one liked the word Associated Nations. So early that morning, before the signing, Roosevelt awakened with the whole new idea of calling them the United Nations. It's where the word was born. So excited was he, he had himself wheeled into Churchill's bedroom, our bedroom, to tell him the news. But it so happened Churchill was just coming out of the bathtub and had absolutely nothing on. So Roosevelt said, I'm so sorry, I'll come back in a few moments. Churchill, ever able to speak, still naked, in a very formal voice, said, Oh no, please stay. The Prime Minister of Great Britain has nothing to hide from the President of the United States. <laughs> can you imagine? You're dripping from the tub and you can say that? So that night, as soon as the President and Mrs. Clinton left, I couldn't wait to go in the bathtub. Then I truly felt I was in the presence of the greatness of the past. But back to Eleanor in World War II. Sadly, as the war drew to a close, attitudes toward women workers shifted. Though many women still wanted to keep working, they said that seven out of 10 said they had found such pride in their work, they enjoyed the sociability of the workplace, the financial independence, the mastery of new skills, and the pleasure of a job well done. But the pressures mounted on them to stop working. Daycare centers were shut down unceremoniously, not to reopen for a generation. The media shifted. Women were now barraged with the pleasures of domesticity and the glories of the suburban housewife. Rosie the Riveter was replaced by the happy homemaker. Articles abounded linking juvenile delinquency with working mothers. And still, despite everything, though female employment fell for a short time, something had been set in motion. And by the late 40s, it began rising again, soon surpassing the wartime peak, and it has continued to rise, of course, ever since. And not surprisingly, the women of World War II were the mothers of the women's liberation generation that solidified what is arguably the most important social revolution of the last century, fundamentally changing the relationships between men and women and between women and children. And yet, of course, as we all know, we still face difficult challenges of balancing work and family. I well remember the relentless anxiety I experienced when I was trying to combine teaching at Harvard marriage, writing my second book, and three children. My first book on LBJ had been written while I was a professor and still single. I could teach all day and stay up all hours writing if I wanted to. Once I was married with the kids, my days and nights felt like one giant to-do list. I finally decided I couldn't teach and write and be with the kids, so I took the risk of becoming a writer without the security of the university professorship. <clears throat> still, my second book on the Kennedys took 10 years. I remember being at a cocktail party while still in the midst of writing and no longer at Harvard, and I heard somebody say, whatever happened to Doris Kearns anyway? As if I had died somehow. And I wanted to hit them and say, I've got three boys, that's what happened to me, and this is the life I have chosen for now. But my sons grew older, I had more time to write, I finally finished the Kennedy book, and then Franklin and Eleanor. They teased me, my kids do, that when I was working on Franklin and Eleanor, they could hear me in my study, talking first to Franklin, begging him to be nicer to Eleanor, talking to Eleanor, begging her to forget the affair he had had so many years before, knowing that he loved her. And then when the kids went to college, I could spend whole days with Abraham Lincoln and his team of rivals. I could accept lectures around the country, talk about history and politics on television, and work on the Lincoln movie, things I couldn't have easily done when the kids were younger. It was just a matter of being patient and trusting that I'd be able to balance work and family better as time went on. So I can say to all of you, the overwhelming majority younger than me, that while balance between work and family is never perfect, the key thing is to know what fits best for you at which stage of your life. I will never forget the central wisdom I learned four decades ago when I was a graduate student at Harvard with the great psychologist Eric Erickson. He taught us that the richest and fullest lives attain an inner balance between three dimensions, work, love, and play in equal order. By work, he meant finding something that gives you meaning, that exercises your talents to the fullest degree. By love, emotional connections with family, friends, and colleagues. And by play, engaging in activities, hobbies, or sports that capture your fancy, that allow you to relax and replenish your energy. To pursue one of these spheres to the disregard of the others, he advised us, is to open oneself to ultimate sadness whereas to pursue all three with equal dedication, 
though with different intensity at different times in your life, is to make possible a life blessed with fulfillment as well as achievement. I will therefore always be grateful to my father for giving me my field of play through that lifelong attachment to the game of baseball, allowing me to follow my passion from spring until fall, providing a continual source of relaxation and renewal. Though when the Dodgers abandoned Brooklyn for Los Angeles, I was so devastated I couldn't follow baseball for several years until I came to Harvard, went for the first time to Fenway Park, so reminiscent of Ebbets Field, that I fell instantly in love and became an equally irrational Red Sox fan. While, I'm, while I was still in my 20s, I know, there's some of us here. <laughs> it is Boston, after all. While I was still in my 20s, before I got married and had my children, however, my father died of a sudden heart attack. Wanting to pass on my father's love of baseball to my sons, I took them to Fenway when they were still babes in arms. We've had season tickets now for more than 30 years, and even now I can sit at Fenway with my sons sometimes and close my eyes and imagine myself a young girl once more in the presence of my father, watching the players of my youth on the grassy fields below, Jackie Robinson, Pee Wee Reese, Duke Snyder, and Gil Hodges. I must say there is magic in these moments. When I open my eyes and I see my sons in the place where my father once sat, I feel an almost invisible loyalty and love, linking my sons to the grandfather whose face they never had a chance to see, but whose heart and soul they have come to know through the countless stories I have told which is why in the end I shall always be grateful for this curious love of history, allowing me to spend a lifetime looking back into the past, allowing me to believe that the private people we have loved and lost in our families and the public figures we have respected in history really can live on so long as we pledge to tell and to retell the stories of their lives. Thank you so much for letting me do that with you today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.